I'm grateful that you've chosen to join me for this week's online message from Kenmore Community Church. Uh, I always like to begin with a word of prayer, so let's do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together and study your word. And today, uh, this day after Christmas, uh, we pray, Father, that um, thanking you for, uh, again, the birth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, reflect on that birth that we've had over the last number of weeks. And I pray that each one had a, uh, a good Christmas celebration with their family and friends. And uh, Lord, we uh, just pray as we anticipating anticipate a new year now that you will continue to uh, fill us with your spirit, that you will continue to transform us so that we become more and more like Jesus in our thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions. We thank you again, Lord, uh, for the new covenant. Thank you that our salvation is by grace through faith and not of anything that we have done, but it's all of you. And uh, Father, we desire that your kingdom would come, your will would be done uh, in 2022. Father, we do pray for those who are uh, dealing with various medical issues. We pray for their healing. We pray for their uh, sustain uh, that you would sustain them by your grace. And uh, Father, just um, help them to lean upon you and lean into you in the midst of their difficulties. I pray for those, Father, that have um, financial needs, have material needs. I pray for your provision in their life and. Uh, Lord, I pray for those, again, who may be dealing with fear and anxiety in these days. Uh, we thank you that you are the Prince of Peace, as we talked about last week, and we pray that your peace would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And uh, Father, we, we just pray that your Spirit would work in us and, and um, continue to help us to uh, obey your Word and live for you and mature in our relationship to you. Here at Kenmore Community Church, we want to remember our families of the week. We do pray for uh, Jeff Palison, for uh, Corey and Kim Rainboth, for Sally Rell, and for Alicia from our youth group. Uh, we pray that those folks would sense your presence with them in a very special way this week, that you would bless and encourage them and uh, help them in whatever they might be dealing with. We also want to pray for our mission focus today, which is the Gideons. We thank you for the work of the Gideons as they uh, hand out the scriptures at schools and, and place them in hotels. And we just continue to pray for open doors for the work of the Gideons. And may you uh, encourage them as they not only hand out the scriptures, but often they uh, have opportunity to personally share their testimony and invite people to trust in Christ. So we pray for your blessing on that ministry today. And Father, we do ask that you would uh, open our eyes and ears now as we turn to studying your word. Uh, may uh, each one of us, by your spirit, uh, you know, discover something new in this passage that we can apply to our lives and uh, live more for your glory. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for this Sunday after Christmas, I've chosen to preach on a passage that I don't think I've ever preached on before. It's Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. I invite you to take your Bible and turn to that passage now. Uh, it's a passage that makes sense uh, following the, uh, the birth narrative of Jesus. Uh, this passage emphasizes uh, three events and three prophecies. Uh, related to Jesus uh, in his early days after his birth and uh, you know when he was just a, a toddler and so it makes sense that we would follow the, the, the birth narrative of Jesus with these stories of, of Jesus and his family uh, as they began uh, life together after uh, Jesus was born there in uh, Bethlehem. And so, uh, again, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23, and follow along as I read. When they had gone, the uh, they that, that Matthew is talking about here are the wise men. When they had left uh, Jesus, where they had gone to see him in the home where he was in Bethlehem. That's uh, where we're picking up the story. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. 
So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. When that was said through the then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. My main thought from this passage for you today is that in Matthew 2, 13-23, we discover three events and prophecies regarding Jesus' early years which should prompt uh, from us several responses. So let me lay out these three events and these three prophecies that Matthew calls to our attention, and then, then at the end of my message I will focus on uh, how I believe we ought to respond to them. So the first event was the escape to Egypt. We see this in verses 12 through 15. Uh, the Magi uh, leave. Uh, remember, they had come uh, from the east, and they had gone to Jerusalem, and they had consulted Ke- uh, Herod and asked, uh, where is this king of the Jews to be born? And uh, Herod has assembled his counselors, and they said, in Bethlehem. So the wise men went to Bethlehem. They followed the star to Bethlehem. They brought their gifts to Jesus uh, of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then they had been warned in a dream not to return to Herod. Remember, Herod wanted them to come and report to him about where the child was. Uh, but they, uh, the, the Magi had been warned in a dream not to return. Uh, to Herod and tell him that information. So they left by another uh, route. Now at the same time an angel appears to Joseph in a dream and warns him to immediately flee to Egypt because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Now this uh, command from the angel was very explicit. Joseph marrying the child must flee to Egypt and remain there not only till Herod's death but until given the word to return. Now, why would Herod want to kill uh, this uh, child? Why would Herod want to kill uh, the baby Jesus? Well, Herod was a ruthless man and leader. We know from history that he killed one of his wives. He killed a number of his sons because he thought they were planning a coup to overthrow him. And uh, in order to ensure that there would be weeping on the day of his death because he was a a king over uh, Judea, but uh, the Jews didn't like him. He was not a Jew by birth, and uh, he was very unpopular. And so in order to ensure that there would be weeping uh, on the day of his death, he ordered that, uh, as he neared death, he ordered that all the Jewish nobility be rounded up and uh, held until he died, and when he died, they were to be killed, so that there would be weeping on the day of his uh, death. So he was a very ruthless man and and leader. Now, not only was this angel's command to Joseph explicit, it was also urgent. In response to the dream, Joseph took the child and his mother in the middle of the night and began the 75-mile journey uh, to the border with Egypt. Now, there was a very large uh, Jewish presence in Egypt at the time, as many others had also fled the reign uh, of Herod. So when Mary and Joseph and Jesus arrived in Egypt, uh, they would have found a a friendly welcome. They would have found a community of people uh, with whom they could associate and live until uh, the word came that it was safe for them to uh, return uh, to Israel. Now Matthew tells us that the prophecy that was fulfilled here was that out of Egypt I called my son. Uh, He he, uh, records uh, that an angel directed Joseph to take the Holy Family into Egypt for safety from the king who was trying to uh, to kill the boy 
But then he says, by doing so and then coming out of Egypt, that uh, Jesus would be fulfilling the prophecy in Hosea 11.1, 1, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Now if you read that passage, you'll see that Hosea is writing about the nation of Israel that God called out of Egypt at the Exodus. Uh, back in the book of Exodus, you can read about that if you're not familiar with that story. He refers to Israel when the nation was a child, meaning at the beginning of its national existence, when Israel was a young nation. But the metaphorical language of the nation as a child and as God's son comes from Exodus itself. Moses said to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so he may worship you, but you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. That's from Exodus 4, 22-23. You may remember that the final plague that God was going to bring upon the Egyptian nation because they re the Pharaoh refused to let God's people come out after being held in captivity in Egypt for hundreds of years, the final plague was that God would send the angel of death over the nation of Egypt and the firstborn son in every household would be killed unless as he had the Israelites do, they had painted their doorposts with the blood of a sacrificial uh, lamb. But God, uh, in, in the original context of, uh, of Hosea referring to that prophecy, out of Egypt I have called my son, uh, was uh, that Exodus experience. And God was about to bring retribution on the Egyptians for the killing of the uh, Israelites. And in the announcement, there is a world word play on the word son. The nation of Israel was God's firstborn son. This was a figurative use of the word. But the firstborn son of Pharaoh was a literal son. So there are two different meanings of the word son in the passage that I just read in Exodus. Hosea refers to the first when he refers to Israel as God's son. Matthew is fully aware that Jesus is God's son in another sense of the word. This word to Matthew catches some of the meaning of both of those uses in Exodus. He is the son of God in that like Pharaoh's son, he shares the nature of his father and is the heir to the throne, even though he was never procreated. And he is also the son of, as Israel was a son, in that he fulfills the destiny of the nation of Israel. In other words, Matthew sees Jesus as the true Israel, the seed of Abraham in the purest sense. Everything Israel was supposed to be, Jesus would be. And the things that God did for and through Israel find fulfillment in the person and works of Jesus. Matthew sees the parallels between Jesus' sojourn in Egypt, preservation from the killing of the children, and return to the promised land, and the historical event of the nation of Egypt being preserved through the killing of the firstborn sons, and the call to leave Egypt and to go to Israel. So he sees the old as a, uh, a type, a preview, a foreshadowing of the new event. Jesus would walk through, as it were, the experiences of the nation of Israel in order to fulfill all the needs of the nation. So Matthew sees that Hosea's words that were written for the nation of Israel using the figure of a son, uh, Matthew sees them finding their uh, truest fulfillment or fullest meaning in the experience of Jesus, the son, as he is eventually called out of Egypt to the land of Israel. Uh, we therefore have two levels of meaning for Hosea 11.1 1, as Matthew quotes it. The primary reference is Israel and the Exodus, but the ultimate application is to the fulfillment of the Exodus from Egypt in the person of Jesus. Matthew is not simply connecting Jesus' return from Egypt with the Exodus of Israel from Egypt. He's connecting all that was involved with the Exodus with Jesus. So. Uh, Matthew is saying that that prophecy in Hosea 11.1, 1, Out of Egypt I have called my son, even though originally Hosea was referring back to uh, the exodus of the nation of Israel, who was called God's son at that time, firstborn son, uh, Matthew is connecting those two events. Jesus is the fullest um, fulfillment uh, of that event. So that's the first event, Jesus uh, and Joseph and Mary having to flee to Egypt in that first prophecy, out of Egypt I've called my son. Now the second event we see in this passage is in uh, verses 16 and 17, and I've titled this Herod's Murderous Rage. Um, furious that he had been outwitted by the Magi, the Magi did not come back and report to him where the baby had been born, 
Herod gives the order to kill all the boys in Bethlehem, baby boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, uh, to coincide with the time the Magi had revealed that the king of the Jews had been born. So uh, uh, Herod is trying to cover all his bases. He didn't know the exact time this child has been born, but he had a, a rough idea, and so the child could have been anywhere from you know six months to two years old at that point, which is why he makes the order as he does. Now his reason for doing so was likely to eliminate a potential rival to his throne. Remember the Magi had shown up and said, where is this king of the Jews to be born? Uh, Herod didn't want any rival to his throne. He considered himself uh, the king of the Jews. Now we have no exact idea of the number of young boys who may have been killed, but the number has often been exaggerated as being in the thousands. Um, in such a small village as Bethlehem was, however, even including the surrounding area, the number was probably not large. Uh, the best estimates I've seen are from 12 to 15 uh, young boys. Now, one would be too much, but, um, you, you know, and, and it was obviously a brutal thing to do, but it was likely not in the thousands of little boys that were killed. And Matthew goes on to say that, uh, again, this event of Herod killing these boys uh, fulfilled prophecy, uh, which he says, I'm summing up as Rachel weeping for her children. Now this second prophecy comes from Jeremiah 31, 15. And Jeremiah records uh, his vision with tears of lamentation as he watches not only the city of Jerusalem being destroyed, but innocent children being slaughtered in in the Babylonian invasion. Jeremiah uh, writes in these chapters about the people being taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And as the Babylonians sweep in, there's, you know, there's warfare and there's bloodshed and there's brutality and many children are killed in that process. And so he imagines uh, with his poetic vision a uh, Rachel, the wife of Jacob. Rachel had long been dead, but she was the wife of Jacob, and Jacob's name was eventually um, changed to Israel. And so Rachel was kind of seen as the mother of the nation of Israel. Uh, she was the uh, mother of Joseph and Benjamin, as you may recall. And so uh, the idea that during the Babylonian invasion, all these people would be killed, Jeremiah envisions Rachel weeping for her children, the, the children of her nation is what he's talking about. She becomes the ancestral representative of all those mothers in the land who wept for their children at that time. But it's interesting to note that this lamentation by uh, Jeremiah is in the middle of four chapters, Jeremiah 30 through 33, uh, that are fulfilled, are, are filled with comfort and consolation and joy. In fact, Jeremiah outlines the new covenant that God would bring to his people. I will bring you a new covenant and I will write my law in your heart and I will put my spirit within you. That new covenant is described in these same chapters where, where uh, Jeremiah um, has this pro, uh, poetic vision of Rachel weeping for her children at the time of the, uh, uh, the invasion of the Babylonians and people being taken in captivity to uh, Babylon. And uh, so, you know, in the midst of this heartache, uh, Jeremiah talks about this joy and, and um, comfort and consolation that God is going to bring. Out of the chaos and violence and death at the hands of wicked rulers, there would come a new covenant bring, bringing forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit, and eternal life. Now Jesus knew that, or, or Matthew knew that Jesus was the Messiah, uh, the branch, and that in the upper room at the Last Supper he inaugurated uh, the new covenant. He said in 1 Corinthians 11:25, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So when he reported the killing of innocent children in Bethlehem, he immediately saw the parallel with Jeremiah's day. Once again, God would bring life out of death, the life of Jesus out of uh, the uh, deaths of the innocent children. And with his life, he would bring eternal life for those who died for him in that little village of Bethlehem. 
And Matthew indicated that if Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy of uh, Messiah the branch described in, in Jeremiah, and if he inaugurated the new covenant by his blood, then the lamentation over the children in Jeremiah's day also finds fulfillment in the weeping of the mothers for their infants in Bethlehem in the days of Jesus. It is one of the most tragic episodes in the New Testament. Um, it's a reminder of how evil men can become in their quest for power. And to Matthew, it's a reminder of how very much the world needs a redeemer. The only solution for this kind of world is a savior who will save people from their sins and usher in a new age of righteousness and peace. The third event and accompanying prophecy that we find in this passage, I've entitled The Return to Nazareth. We see this in verses 19 to 23. Uh, after Herod died, the angel uh, of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and tells him that it's okay for him to take his family back to the land of Israel because those who were trying to kill the child are now dead. Now it looks like Joseph initially planned to return to Judea, but when he learned that Herod's son Archelaus was reigning there uh, and being warned in another yet another dream, uh, he returned to Galilee and lived in Nazareth. And Matthew tells us here that uh, as a result the prophecies were fulfilled he would be called a Nazarene. There's a little change in, in words there uh, that Matthew used in the, in, the pa in the previous two prophecies he said to fulfill what the prophet said and now he says to fulfill what the prophets said he would be called a Nazarene. Now, in quoting this prophecy, Matthew says it was something uh, that was said by the prophets, not just one prophet. The problem we encounter is that there's no written record of this exact prophecy. So what are we to make of this? Well, there have been five or six uh, answers given to this. And rather than give you all five or six, I'm going to give you what I think is the best answer uh, to this. Uh, it's very possible that, you know, the, the prophets were saying he would be called a Nazarene and it hadn't been written down. However, I believe what Matthew is doing is using the word Nazarene in reference to a person who is despised and rejected. In the first century, Nazareth was a small town about 55 miles north of Jerusalem, and it had a negative reputation among the Jews. In fact, Galilee as a whole had a, rep a negative uh, reputation. It was uh, looked down upon by Judeans, and Nazareth of Galilee was especially despised. You may remember uh, when Philip went to tell his friend Nathaniel that he had found the Messiah, and uh, Philip told um, Nathaniel that the Messiah was from Nazareth, his comment was, can anything good come from Nazareth? So Nazareth had this reputation of, you know, not being a place where anybody important uh, came from, not being a place where anything important happened. Uh, if this was Matthew's emphasis, the prophecies Matthew had in mind could include a couple of passages that were uh, in the Old Testament concerning the Messiah. In fact, there are a number of them that talk about the Messiah coming from a place of obscurity, of being despised and rejected. Let me just share a couple of them with you. One is Psalm 22, verses 6 and 7. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. That Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm. And that's a quote from there of, about what, how the Messiah would be viewed. It's true that uh, Nazarenes were scorned by everyone, and so some could see this messianic prophecy as an allusion to Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. And then, of course, we have the passage in Isaiah that's quite lengthy, Isaiah 53. I'll just quote one verse, um, verse 3 from Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom uh, people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low uh, esteem. Again, in Jesus' day, Nazarenes were despised and rejected, and so Isaiah's prophecy could be viewed as an indirect reference to Jesus' background as, a, as the supposed son of a carpenter from Nazareth. In Psalm, if Psalm 22, 6 and 7 and Isaiah 53, 3 are the prophecies that Matthew had in mind, 
then the meaning of he shall be called a Nazarene is something akin to this. He shall be despised and mocked by his own people. Uh, Jesus not only identified with humanity by coming into our world, he also identified with the lowly of this world. His upbringing in an obscure and despised town served as an important part of his mission. Jesus even identified himself as Jesus of Nazareth when he appeared to uh, Saul on the way to Damascus, that blinding vision where Saul was converted and eventually uh, took his uh, Greek name of the Apostle Paul. After his conversion, Paul mentioned Jesus of Nazareth. So one of the names of the early Christians was also, uh, they were called Nazarenes. And uh, it wasn't a, a uh, meant to be a positive thing. It was meant to be an insult to the early Christians that they were called Nazarenes. So I think this prophecy means that the Messiah would come from obscurity, be despised and rejected. And Jesus fulfills the prophet's statements regarding the Messiah being despised and rejected and coming from a place of obscurity as he was raised in Nazareth. So we've seen three events and three prophecies now that Matthew calls to our attention. So how should we respond to this? Uh, I think there's five ways we can respond. First of all, we ought to believe. Jesus' fulfillment of these prophecies reinforces the fact that he is the promised Messiah come to save us from our sins. Our response should be to put our faith and trust in him as our Savior and Lord. If you have not yet put your faith and trust in Jesus, I encourage you today to respond to the drawing of the Holy Spirit in your life and uh, put your faith and trust in Christ through prayer. Tell him that you accept him as your Lord and Savior. Ask him to forgive your sins and, and uh, invite him now to become the boss of your life, the Lord of your life. So first way we can respond again is to believe that Jesus is the Messiah that was promised, that he is the Son of God, that he came to save us from our sins. A second response to this passage is that we can behold the wisdom and sovereignty of God. God in his wisdom and sovereignty protected his son, our Savior, in his infancy and early childhood from those who would seek to kill him, enabling his plan of salvation to take place as he intended. Our response then would be to trust in God's wisdom and sovereignty over the events of our lives. If God can be sovereign over the, the life of his son and protect him from the evil intent of Herod and uh, orchestrate these events, going to Egypt, coming back out of Egypt, living uh, then in Nazareth, uh, we can uh, take comfort in the fact that God in his wisdom and sovereignty is watching over us and uh, uh, and we can trust him in the midst of that, that uh, he, uh, he will watch over us and he will not give us more than we can handle and um, you know, we can rest secure, even though the world may be going crazy around us, that God is sovereignly in control, that he is working his plan and his purposes. A third response is to trust God's word. Uh, when God makes a promise in his word, you can count on it. Here were these prophecies that Matthew refers to uh, that uh, find their fulfillment in the life of Jesus. And those were just three prophecies. There are hundreds of prophecies that find their fulfillment in the life of Jesus. When God uh, makes, makes a statement in his word, we can count on it. We can trust it. And so our response should be to trust God's word, to build our lives upon it. A fourth response would be to obey God's word. Over and over in this passage, we saw Joseph having a dream. Uh, the angel of the Lord appears to him, and uh, he obeys that dream. He knows God has been speaking to him through those angels, and so he obeys God's word. First to flee to Egypt with uh, the mother and uh, the child, and then eventually to return from Egypt to Israel and on that return not to stay in Judea but to go further north and uh, make his uh, home with his family there in Nazareth and so uh, we can obey God's word too remembering that uh, we live our lives 
under the new covenant and the law of Christ. So Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my command. So we want to, in response, again, just as Joseph was obedient to God's word, we want to live in obedience to the commands of Christ. The two greatest commands of Christ are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. All of the other commands of Christ, Jesus said, are summed up in those two commands. And then finally, we can respond to this passage by rejoicing in our freedom in Christ. In this passage, Matthew has been showing us how Jesus embodies and fulfills Old Testament prophecies. In particular, the Exodus event becomes a spiritual metaphor for our deliverance through Christ from the bondage to sin. And Rachel weeping for her children becomes a metaphor for how uh, God in Christ brings life out of death. Remember that, that prophecy that Matthew refers back to about Rachel reaping for her weeping for her children occurs in the midst of uh, Jeremiah talking about the new covenant that God was going to bring uh, in Christ. And so our response is to rejoice in the freedom from sin and the new life that Jesus has provided for his followers. We are not stuck in our sinful, self-centered ways. We are being transformed by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit because of the new covenant in our lives, freeing us to be filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. So another way we can respond to this passage is to rejoice in the freedom that we have in Christ. We have been delivered. We have been set free um, from our bondage to sin because of what Christ has done for us. And we have been filled with His Spirit because of the new covenant and so we can be transformed and become more and more like Jesus in our thoughts, attitudes, and actions. So those are five ways that I believe uh, each of us can respond to this passage. And I pray that you will respond uh, in uh, one or more of those ways. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for this passage and uh, help us to apply it to our lives. Lord, help us to believe in Jesus, to put our faith and trust in uh, him. Help us to trust in your word. Help us to obey your word. And uh, help us, Lord, to uh, rejoice in the freedom that we have in Christ, to remember that we live under the new covenant filled with your spirit. And I pray that you would continue to transform us and we again thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for your love and uh, the salvation that we have in Christ. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.